Okay. Uh, you ready to go? Yeah, perfect. All right, uh, great. Uh, so our next speaker is going to be Joshua Mills uh, from the University of Köln. Uh, and he's going to speak on self-conjugate seven core partitions and class numbers. Okay, uh, thank you very much to all the organizers and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, so this will be kind of a blast through the major results of a recent paper. Um, so I should say everything is joint with Katrin Bringman and Ben Kane. Um, so I better explain these things in the title. Um, so in my own style, I always explain from the inside out. So some intro and definitions. Okay, I guess everyone here already knows this, uh, but a partition lambda of some natural number n, we just say is some non-increasing list of integers, lambda one to lambda s, um, such that their sum is n. So for us, there will always be s parts. Okay, what do we do with this? So for this talk, we want to look at the Ferrer's diagram of lambda. So how do you build this? I'm sure everyone's seen, you just place lambda j dots in the j row. And the conju uh, conjugate of lambda is formed, you just switch the rows and columns of this diagram. So we'll see an example in a minute. So the partition three to one of six just has this Ferrer's diagram. So three in the first row, two in the second, one in the last. Okay, so what's the point? What do we do with these? So for us, we want to look at hook lengths and t-cores. Okay, so if we label the cell of our Ferrer's diagram like a matrix, so I have the top left is one, one. Okay, um, and then we denote uh, by lambda k prime, um, the number of dots in the column k. Then the hook length of the cell jk in the Ferrer's diagram is just given by this formula. And okay, this looks a bit messy, but this is very natural when we come to look at it. Uh, if no hook length in any cell of a partition, um, so if I calculate this formula for every cell in our partition, and if none of these um, is divisible by t, then lambda is called a t-core partition. Okay, so a brief example. So let's look at the same partition. So the hook length here of the top left-hand cell is just five. And this weird formula literally just counts this hook here. Now, if I want the second cell, so one, two, just this one here, then I look at the hook here. So it just has length three, so we just count the number of dots on this hook. Okay, if you go through this process for this partition, we have hook lengths of five, three, one, three, one, and one. So what does that mean? That means that this partition lambda is a t-core partition for all t that don't divide these numbers. So for any t not in one, three, and five, this is a t-core partition. Even better for us is that switching rows and columns here leaves uh, lambda the same. So lambda is self-conjugate uh, partition. In particular, um, this is an example of a self-conjugate seven core uh, of the number six. Okay, why do we care about these things? So there are two major applications that I've come across. So t-core partitions, um, they capture the representation theory of these symmetric groups, Sn and An. And how do they do that? So each partition corresponds naturally to some representation um, that takes Sn to your GLD uh, over some finite field. And even better than that is that we know that this representation rho um, is irreducible if and only if our lambda is a p-core. This p is down here on your fp. And this d is just uh, some number, I think it looks like an n factorial divided by the product of your hook lengths. So these are intricately related to representation theory of your um, symmetric groups. The second application is the Ramanujan congruences. So I guess everyone here knows these. Um, so these are the congruences on partitions. And these have been proved uh, many years ago using modular arguments, but the first time that we were able to combinatorially prove this was Garvan, Kim, and Stanton, who used t-cores, so these weird partitions, to define certain crank statistics and then give a proof combinatorially. Okay, so you say, Josh, that's great. We can define all this stuff, but do they exist? Okay, well, first, let's let CTN be the number of t-cores of n, and then we stick an s in front if it's self-conjugate. So the main thing we concentrate is SC7. We'll also need these Hurwitz class numbers. So if D is a discriminant, we let uh, H of mod D, so for us, this will always be positive. 
um, be the deep Hurwitz class number. What does this do? As everyone knows, this just counts the number of SL2 equivalence classes of binary quadratic forms, weighted by some automorphism group. Okay, so what was being done? So do they exist? Yes. So Ono and Granville, uh, Granville Ono showed positivity um, of CT of n for every t greater or equal to four. So whenever you take t greater than four, every integer has a t core partition. There are similar positivity results for SCT for most t. So t is eight or t is greater or equal to 10. Okay, I said we concentrate on SC7, but there were basically, there were not too many that are zero, uh, SC7 of n. So most of the time, there are self-conjugate t cores. Okay, how many? Well, exact formula are known for t equals two and three for CT, and SCT for some small t, so here I think two, three, five, and possibly six. Okay, what else do we know? We know asymptotics via the circle method, for both CT and SCT. So this is by a paper of Anderson and a paper of Alpagir. So we know vaguely how these things grow. And you'll see here, I mentioned t equals two and three. Well, C4 is somehow special. And so this is O node C in 1997. And they showed that if eight N plus five is square three, then the number of four core partitions is given by a class number. So this is somehow a strange connection between four core partitions and class numbers on the right hand side. And how do they show this? Well, they showed this in two ways. One was using generating functions and modular forms, and the other one was using combinatorial structures. And these two ideas we borrowed heavily from in our paper. Okay, what came next? Next was Ono Raji. So this is very recent, I think last year even. So then we need a bit more notation. So we need some number d sub n, which just depends on n congruent to one or three mod four. And you'll see here, well, this is basically comes directly from Gauss's class number formula. It's just a factor of four that's different. What did they show? They show that if n is not five mod seven and is positive and odd, then the self-conjugate seven cores are also class numbers, depending on n mod four or eight. Okay, but this is a strange restriction somehow that n is not allowed to be five mod seven. So that's quite a chunk of n that we don't know anything about. And a bigger chunk is that these have to be odd. Okay, how did they prove this? They only proved this using the modular generating function type arguments. So there's a bit of a gap left. Um, so this is something um, Ken noticed, Ken Ono, and pointed out to me that if we combine these results of Ono C and Ono Iwaji, we find that for 8n plus 1, not congruent to 5 mod 7, and 56n plus 21 square 3, we have some curious identity. So on the left-hand side, we have two times the number of self-conjugate 7 cores on some arithmetic progression is the number of uh, um, four cores on a different arithmetic progression. Why should this be true? So this was my major motivation for studying these problems. Okay, so what did we show? Like I said, we had two main aims. So first, extend Ono Raji to all n. So it doesn't have to be positive odd. It doesn't have to be not five mod seven. And also I want to provide some explanation for this curious identity. So on the one hand, um, the first one Ono C was proved with combinatorial structures and there's a lot of structure behind that. Ono Raji, like I said, was only proved on generating functions and modular forms. So we want some more explanation for this identity. Okay, so I guess I'll go over the results and not too much into their proofs. So what's the first theorem? First theorem is for any n, the number of self-conjugate seven cores is some linear combination of class numbers. And here, if a fraction is uh, not an n, we just define it to be zero for ease. Okay, well, this is nice. There is some linear combination of class numbers, but it would look much nicer to have it as a single class number, to not have to work out four class numbers in this case. So for that, we need a little bit more notation. Okay, so this looks horrible. So let L uh, in N zero be chose maximally such that this congruence holds. 
But the idea is we define dn in a similar way to Ono Raji, depending on n mod 4. And if n is 2 mod 4, this L allows us to get back in one of the previous cases. So we can just reduce if n is 2 mod 4. And the same thing, another number on new n is our factor in front. So it's either a quarter or a half. And again, if n is 2 mod 4, we get to reduce back. OK, so in terms of a single class number, um, we let HP count the number of P primitive classes of integral bin binary quadratic forms. So what does that mean? Here P is some prime. It means that prime P does not divide um, all of the coefficients of our quadratic form. So if Q is ABC, some quadratic form, then P does not divide their GCD. And it comes with the same weighting as a normal class number. Then for every N, we have this, I think, quite beautiful formula. The number of self-conjugate seven cores is just up to some factor, the number of seven primitive, um, seven primitive binary quadratic forms of some discriminant, depending on N. Okay, so this extends on Raji, but all of the proofs here were also on generating functions using modular forms. So we also want to give some combinatorial explanation. So for this, take a prime, prime P, chop up our discriminant into a fundamental and some square. And then our fundamentals, um, we say that this binary quadratic form ABC of our discriminant D is totally imprimitive if the power of P dividing this GCD is maximal. So this just means, for example, maybe here I have a four, a four, and a four. This is not too totally imprimitive. Okay. So what do we do? We construct some map that takes self-conjugate seven core and spits out some binary quadratic form. So for any self-conjugate seven core that you give me, I will give you its corresponding binary quadratic form that lies in some class group. How do we construct these? These are constructed via Abakai and extended T residue diagrams. Whatever these things are, these are basically more combinatorial ways um, to represent various partitions. So what's the main point here is for any n, the image of this map spits out a unique non-principal genus of certain binary quadratic forms, in this case, the seven primitive, two totally imprimitive. You can just think about these as some quadratic forms with a particular discriminant. Even better, suppose that L is chosen maximally, such that the same congruence hold and some number, so here 7n plus 14 over 2 to the 2l has r distinct prime divisors. And each equivalence class in this genus is the image of a certain number of self-conjugate seven cores. So this map is really explicit. It tells you if you give me some of your favorite self-conjugate seven cores, I can tell you the genus um, that it spits out, and I can tell you how many things um, are in the orbit that map to the same genus here, and the same equivalence class in the genus, sorry. Okay, so here I've been talking about SC7, SC4, and I guess I have 10-ish minutes left to go over some other things. Okay, so we also gave some um, descriptions of whether identities like this, this curious equality, can hold for other T. So here we only had seven and a four here. So what happens if I replace this four with a two or a three? Okay, for t equals two, three, and five, there are no arithmetic progressions where ct and sc two t minus one are integer multiples of one another. And here, non-trivially just means that sometimes they're always zero. Okay, even better, they can't hold even asymptotically. So even if I look at just their asymptotics, whether they settle down into something like this, this equation, this never happens. Okay, so what happens if I take t greater than five? Well, for this, we rely on these asymptotics that I mentioned by Anderson and Alpage for ct and sc2t minus one. Here's our conjecture. There are no arithmetic regressions on which ct is an integer multiple of sc2t minus one, even asymptotically for basically all t. So we believe that t equals four is the only case this happens, a very special case. 
So what are some easy results towards this? Well, first of all, why 2t minus 1 and t? This is very clear if you just look at their asymptotics. And we also provide some easy results on the kind of shapes of these arithmetic progressions that they could be. But the difficulty is that, like I said here, Anderson and Alpage use the circle method. And if anyone here is familiar with it, the main terms in the circle method are not so easy to control. Yeah. So we have to look at the fraction of two main terms of circle method arguments. And these things, we're not sure if they settle down eventually asymptotically. So if anyone here has worked on uh, circle method kind of things and fractions of main terms, I'd be very interested to hear um, how you would deal with this. Okay. So maybe I'll end briefly with just some open questions that I would like to understand more and maybe people here could tell me about. So the results in this paper, they extend the framework for understanding the combinatorics of more general self-conjugate partitions. So our paper basically gives a complete description of self-conjugate seven core partitions. And the same thing can be done, the same process for any T. So I can always um, do the same process we do in this paper and come up with a complete description of self-conjugate partitions. So what are the consequences of this? This is something I haven't had a chance to think about too much, but are there consequences in representation theory, for example? Okay, another question is that in these influential papers of Garvan, Kierman, and Stanton, in particular one of Garvan and Stanton, they give a table of groups so certain dihedral and cyclic groups that act on T-core partitions. So can we use um, the combinatorial structure of the partitions that we give to explain these groups? This is something that um, Stanton brought up again a couple of weeks ago in a seminar. So can we use these explicit descriptions of partitions to explain these dihedral groups that act? A third question is, okay, so we know that we know we have asymptotics of the number of t-core partitions, but we could also study divisibility. So this is a bit more refined knowledge of, say, the number of certain representations. So we want to look at the divisibility of t-cores along arithmetic progressions. And I've started um, briefly with Zach Tripp to look at this question. Um, a characterization of potential progressions for t equals four in terms of poets class numbers was obtained by Beckwith, Ram, and Richter very recently. I think there's a preprint earlier this year. And a final question is also one I'm looking with Zach at, is can we construct a combinatorial map between two different genera? So where does this come from? So in our paper, we construct some non-principal genus in the class group. But in the original paper of Ono C in 1997, their map maps to the principal genus. So somehow we're mapping to two different parts of this class group using each of our maps from four cores and self-conjugate seven cores. So there must be a way to map between um, genera in the class group just using um, our self-conjugate and um, four core partitions. So if we just look at the combinatorial structure of these partitions, can we easily construct some map between genera in a class group? And I guess I'm out of time, but hopefully this gives you all a quick overview of the main results of the paper and maybe some people want to read it. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Uh, any questions? So I have a question. So you mentioned mm -hmm. that there's, uh, so there's basically a relationship between class numbers and uh, counts of the these uh, t cores. Yes. Uh, so I'm curious. Uh, like for example, there was this result of uh, Watkins uh, classifying, you know, all discriminants for which the ordinary class number uh, is at most 100. Uh, he was able to give a complete list unconditionally. Uh, can this be used to prove any sort of results of this flavor? Um, yeah, I believe it should be possible. Um, 
I haven't thought explicitly about this problem. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I imagine, so a lot of information is known about these four core partitions, um, especially on the modular side, and that they're all modular forms of weight three halves um, in explicit mm -hmm. spaces, things like this. Um, the issue is, as you see on this slide, um, we're kind of forced into certain arithmetic progressions mm -hmm. uh, on the class number side. So we can't really escape like a factor of four or something in here. Mm -hmm. So we could certainly say a lot of results on over its class numbers in some certain arithmetic progressions, um, but to get outside of that, there's not too much we can do with these uh, T-core partitions. Maybe there are other partitions that are slight deformations of T-cores that give some closely related things, um, but I'm not sure they've been defined yet. Uh, other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if nothing, uh, thank you very much. Let's, let's give our speaker a, a virtual round of applause. Um,